Welcome to Kick Cage. Welcome once again to the Kick Cage and episode 24 with Greg Johnson, uh, who was a former SAS operator. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you, Brian, and grateful for the opportunity. That's my pleasure. Um, let's first talk about uh, you entering into the military, because uh, you were uh, a TA to start off with. Yeah, um, before that, as, yeah, I think as a, as a child uh, growing up, my father was Air Force, so I spent a lot of time around the military and, um, you know, I'd tell the story of the Falklands War was happening and and as a kid, I was infatuated, infatuated with the military and uh, the Falklands War series come out. Um, and on the last, I think there was 14 issues of that, uh, of the Falklands War uh, magazine that we got here in New Zealand. And on the last one was a picture of a uh, SBS guy. Um, and he had a big Bergen on and, and gaiters and a, and a green Gore-Tex jacket. And, and I was just like, man, one day that's what I want to do. And um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't have an SBS. So um, we had an SAS. And as I, as I got older and realized what the military was about, so everything from me, from the TA to, to joining our, our we call regular force to the infantry was just a stepping stone to, to want to go to the unit. <laughs> Um, what was the first challenge you faced, obviously going from uh, a territorial army to the regulars? Um, what sort of changes did you face going from that? Mate, I was, actually got a friend, uh, an ex-army officer staying with us at the moment, and we were just laughing about it tonight. I was I was really lucky from my TA time. Um, there was still, I only did a year in TA, um, and because it was so small in New Zealand, the instructors from my TA basic, uh, basic training were still around. So... I spent most of my full-time army basic training, just babysitting. Um, so, yeah, I was luckily that I I found it really easy. Um, yeah, so it was yeah it was was easy, and I found it um, luckily yeah to be to be not hard. Yeah, so it wasn't a challenge at all. Gratefully, good. Um, so you were in a, a, a recce uh, squad. Do you think that helped you uh, prepare you for SAS selection? Yeah, and yeah, I did three years with a, a reconnaissance battalion, reconnaissance platoon, uh, and definitely, yeah, the small unit tactics, as you'll know, you know that they do. Um, our recce at the time was was pretty much based on what our SAS did as well. Um, you know, moving in the bush as a, a four man, five man team. Um, so once I passed selection and and did what we call our cycle of training, yeah, just that that experience made it so much easier. Yeah, yeah. It was just second nature by that time. Um, when it came to a SAS selection, obviously it's renowned for not just testing you physically, but testing you mentally. Um, how mentally testing did you find that? <laughs> Incredibly hard, bro. And um, yeah, it was. Again, I, I I tell the story that um, yeah, there was a period that our selections nine days long, and uh, you do. Um, or the initial fitness testing on day one and a swim test and some running stuff um, outside of the normal army fitness tests. And you do three days and we call it open country. Um, so navigating through the open country. And then we do 20 hours. And when I did it in the sand dunes, carrying 20 litre jerry cans of water um, with your full pack and webbing and, and rifle, um, you do 20 hours of that. And then you do close country. Um, so in the bush navigating. Um, and at that, that phase, I was so tired, bro. I'd, from the jerry cans and the sand dunes, I had no skin left on my hands. Um, my feet were pretty blistered. I didn't have a lot of skin left on my feet. Um, and we, yeah, we were off navigating by ourselves. You had 48 hours to get to a, an end point um, through checkpoints. Um, and I just got to a stage. I was so tired. I just gave up. And um, I we call, you know, what you call the poncho, we call a hoochie. Right, I got my hoochie up. Um, very tactically, uh, got naked, climbed in my sleeping bag and, and I quit. I was like, I'm done. Um, this is just, just too hard. And I'd only been in there for maybe five minutes and the radio goes, I can't remember my number, but whatever, 27, 27, where are you? 27, you know, you need to be at this checkpoint. Got up, packed everything up and carried on. And um, luckily got to the end um, and passed the selection course. But um, yeah, it was incredibly hard, mate. And uh, I find it interesting, like we finished with a 64K walk 
Um, and none of my friends that were actually badged at the time talked about that. Um, so that was incredibly hard. You yeah, just to do those other eight days. And like I said, I was in a pretty shit state physically. Um, and then to go, you know, now you've got 60K to go. Um, yeah, it was, was, was hard. But um, yeah, gratefully, yeah, got through. Um, obviously, to get through that, you would need a certain level of mental resilience. Now, nature versus nurture. Do you think that mental resilience that you had at that point was taught or do you think that was something that was instilled into you? I think both. Yeah. And I say that because like I grew up with a father in the Air Force and a mother who was nurse um, and most of my family were farmers. Um, but I was a weak child, you know, I was useless and cried a lot. And, you know, I wasn't very, you know, I played a lot of sport, but I was never going to be good. Um, you know, I played rugby and I was always scared to tackle. And I had this one uncle who was hardcore farmer. And, you know, he'd always, he told me from, from the time I can remember that I'd never make it in the army, you know, let alone the SAS. I'd never talked about the SAS, but um, yeah. So I think there was that drive to, it didn't drive me to prove anything, but I was driven to be the best I could be. Um, and I was driven from those magazines, the Falklands magazines to, to go to that unit and I think yeah so my parents did instill good values in me um, and I grew up as a disciplined child understanding what was right and wrong and, and drive to, to work hard um, and I was just dyslexic as a child so everything had been a challenge for me you know just going to school every day was a challenge um, so I think those yeah on on that side of nurture yeah definitely um, but then yeah I just wanted to be in the unit and and I set out to achieve that and and, and I did Good. Now, uh, obviously, you were deployed. Um, majority of that was to Afghanistan. Um, what was going through your mind the first time you were being deployed to a, a two-way range, uh, knowing that, you know, potentially you could pay the ultimate sacrifice? I think I'd always said, mate, that I didn't want to be in the infantry if we if I ever got the chance to deploy. <laughs> Um, and gratefully, I, I wasn't. And uh, I was in, I was in the barracks when nine eleven happened. Yeah. Um, in the SAS, uh, and they had a mate come running and knocking on my door. It was early in the morning for us. Um, and he said, "Quickly, turn on your TV." And and I did. And and I watched it. I think the second plane crash into the towers, and then all our pages went off. Um, you know, so it was get to work as quick as you can. And um. I was on the counterterrorism team at the time in New Zealand back then. We, you know, you did a year on the we call green roll, so we deploy overseas on jobs and and a, and a counterterrorism team. Um, I was on the counterterrorism team, so we all got called into a brief. The whole unit um, and the other squadron they got to go first, um, and then I had to wait a period till till it was my turn to go. But bro, just a pure joy of I was going to get to do my job. You know, I'm sure you know that. And a lot yeah. of your guests you have on, it's that, you know, people don't realize. And I always say to people now, like, oh, what's the army like? And I say, man, if it's, you know, if you trained to be a lawyer, but you never got a case or you trained as a doctor and you never actually got to do a doctor's thing, that's what the military's like until you deploy um, on, on the two-way range. So, um, yeah, I had a mindset, bro. I'd grown up that this is what I wanted to do. I'd read Commando comics all my life. I had an understanding. I'd had other family members in the military and, yeah, I was excited that I was in in the best unit in New Zealand, um, and I was getting to go on operations with some of the best people I've ever met or worked with. So yeah, it was just excitement, pure excitement. Yeah. Um, taking that excitement as, as you as you touch down in Afghanistan, obviously the first time you were going out on patrol or or out on on mission, what? At what point did it feel real? Because obviously you've got that excitement, you've got the adrenaline going through you. It doesn't feel real at that point. So at what point did it feel this was a real conflict? Definitely. Um, so we, when we rotated in, we were the second rotation for our our guys. And this is at the start of the conflict. I went and think in uh, March 2002, um, early March. My first patrol, so we had guys from our first rotation that had stayed to do crossover patrols, you know, to teach us what they'd learned in their time. And um, I think my first patrol, we were kidding up and I was the team medic and my pack was the lightest. My pack webbing and rifle was the lightest at 89 kg. 
I think I had 32 magazines for my M4, you know, four grenades, a couple of, a couple of white FOSS, uh, an M72, two claymores. Um, I had my med patrol pack uh, with all the fluids. Uh, we were carrying a 20 litre jerry can each for extra water. Uh, I had a 203. I think I had 26 M203 bombs. Our kit, bro, that, it got real right then. <laughs> like I've done selection. Um, but bro, that was heavy. We had two guys carrying GPMGs on a patrol. Um, you know, we're in the mountains of Afghan. Me and a, a, and a guy with a GPMG were partnered up and, and he laid down. We were, we were at a rest halt um, and he stopped breathing because his, his chest, you know, he had a chest webbing on and full of 7.62 link. It was that heavy, like he stopped breathing, <laughs> you know. Um, so it got real, real that, bro, that we were scared, you know, yeah. because we're fighting the Taliban and we're a five-man patrol, a six-man patrol, yeah. just dropped off by a helicopter out in the middle of nowhere. And um, yeah, it, it got real, real quick. Um, yeah, at that point. So, um, obviously, being a, a, a five-man team going out and engaging the enemy, um, you must have experienced some quite intense moments uh, during your time of deployment. Um, if you can recollect one of those intense moments, and then perhaps did you have a time where you could decompress and you know acknowledge what you've been through, or was that something you you never did? Not in those early days, like none of those, you know, we didn't know what that decompression was. Um, I think because like 9-11 brought it on for all of us. And I think there'd been such a period that we weren't doing a lot. We we're just excited to be doing it, like I said before. And, yeah. you know, we'd had East Timor for us in New Zealand, but, you know, that was very small. And I didn't go there because I'd, I'd chosen to go to the unit. So um, I never got a chance to deploy there in a, in a role that they were doing. I, I went later on. Um and for me, the things I saw in my SAS time early, uh, I also spent three years as a contractor in Iraq, um, 03 to 06, and that was the height of the sectarian violence. And I saw a lot more there um, than I did uh, in those the first tour I did um, with the unit. We were mostly doing strategic reconnaissance stuff, so either foot-based just observing um, or vehicle-mounted patrols. Um, so yeah, that, it was quite benign in that first period. You know, that O two yeah. to O three in Afghan was was really quiet. Um, yeah, we had a few contacts, but nothing to to write home about. Um, yeah, nothing major. So obviously, you alluded to that you did the uh, contract work. Now, um, the hierarchy was, uh, from what most people remember, as Black Hawk Down. Um, yeah. So obviously, you you were with some incredibly seasoned combat veterans. Uh, and, and as you said, it got quite kinetic uh, while you were there. How did you feel being in a uh, sort of PMC environment compared to being in a military environment? Did you feel slightly less safe or because you had that hierarchy that had been through the meat grinder, uh, did you have the confidence in the people around you? Yeah, my team initially, bro, the first first few years, um, yeah, as a team was amazing. You know, we, like you alluded to, had a lot of ex Delta guys were our senior leadership um, that were all C Squadron Black Hawk Down guys. And um, that was amazing. And the team I was with were all either ex Green Berets or um, there was two ex Kiwi SAS guys, um, me and another guy. Um, just, yeah, high level. And the team was, they were very professional in, in what we did. We were serious about what we did and we were looking after US government officials that was important. And, um, yeah, was was awesome, but did feel naked, bro. Like you knew if you got ambushed, like nobody's <laughs> coming. <laughs> you know, in the military, we're lucky. We got, you know, my my later two is when I went back to the unit and serving in Afghan. Like we didn't go out without AC one thirty or or fast movers or helicopters. Like they were go no go criteria. Um, but in Iraq, it was like, you know, you went and found out who the ODA was around you, and lucky because my senior leadership had connections. You know, we could bro call somebody and and hope like <laughs> hell they would come, um, and and we would network to go. You know, like I said, with the ODAs, the the Green Beret teams, and say, hey, let's have a mutual. We'll come and help you if you need it. Um, but can you please come and help us? But 
yeah, there's lots of times, bro, we just seat of the pants hoping, you know, hoping either somebody would come or you wouldn't get in trouble. You know, 200 Ks along some of those roads, bro, just to try and if the bomb goes off, at least hopefully it'll miss us. Um, that was the, a lot of the theory. So obviously um, the kit difference that you'd have had uh, going from SAS to this PMC, you, you know, you, you alluded to you nearly carrying 100 kilograms each. Now, obviously on this, um, I would imagine a small chest rig, uh, probably some sort of AK or, or old version uh, of an M4A1. Um, I would imagine that would have been feeling very, very different for you. Um, yeah, it was like the first first six months I was in Iraq, I worked for a British company, Control Risk Group. Um, and that was very much the AK and a couple of mags, whatever you could scrounge. Yeah. A mate of mine, when he first went there to work there before me with Control Risk Group, he had an MP5 that you couldn't see down the barrel, was that bent. I think he had a Tokarov pistol with a magazine and the rest he put in his pocket. He had some spare rounds that he, he put in his pocket. So... Yeah, I did two. I did two rotations with them, and and then luckily this American company asked me to come and try out for them, and they were very different, bro. Because of the leadership of that company, the Delta guys, um, our kit was amazing. Yeah, awesome, awesome vests, you know, um, yeah, and good weapons, good optics. Uh, we had we had good gear, top of the line at that that time for contractors in Iraq. Luckily, yeah, good vehicle. And. Obviously, having the kit makes you feel that little bit better. It makes you feel more confident in what you're doing. Uh, but as you said, you you were at the height of the sectarian violence there. Um, again, were you able to decompress and you know compartmentalize everything that had happened to you, or did that take a toll on you mentally? I think my decompression was a mate of mine where all our time off that so we were doing four months on a month off. Um, and I did that for three years. Um, most of my time off was going back to Thailand. So my decompression was, you know, living out some fantasies and, and doing what you do in Thailand and, and alcohol was definitely a, a crutch. And, um, but again, yeah, I've never, you know, luckily I've never been hurt with PTS. Uh, and I've done a lot of understanding, like I said, I, you know, when we were messaging that I've been looking yeah. into PTS for the last 14 years. And I think a big part of me was my upbringing and my choosing to understand what war and combat is. Um, and as a young child with a mother working in ED in the emergency department, you know, I'd go from school to ED <laughs> you know, and I'd wait for her to finish work. And, you know, that was, it was normal for me to be around that stuff. And and later on as a, as a child, she worked for a plastic surgeon and she'd be watching videos back at the old videos, you know, um, whatever VHS they were called yeah. on the surgeon she worked with was doing bloodless surgery. So she'd be at home watching all these videos on the latest techniques of doing surgery. Um, and as a kid, I'd just be sitting on the couch watching these videos. So um, yeah, luckily, bro, I've never been hurt by it. But in my research and learning and, and investigating myself and now offering it to other people, yeah, I, I think I've just been lucky that my my childhood and, and my upbringing and, and my desire to be a soldier um, have protected me from these things. Yeah. Um, so obviously alluding to you've done a lot of work on, on PTS and obviously that's uh, one of the main missions of, of my podcast is to sort of give advice to to serving personnel and veterans when it comes to um, mental health injuries, uh, when it comes to TBIs, depression uh, and PTS. And it, it's quite funny that you, um, the, you you call it PTS as much as I do. I sat on a course the other day for Mental Health England because I'm a uh, mental health first aider and doing a refresher course. And uh, I spoke to the trainer because he kept calling it PTSD. Now, one of the things about mental health uh, and talking about it is stigma. Yeah. Um, one of the things I find about PTS and the stigma behind it is when they start calling it a disorder. Yeah. Personally, um, you know, I don't believe it's a disorder. They should drop the D. And I think, you know, especially when it comes to military personnel, they should class PTS as an injury, not yeah. a disorder. Yeah. We're going to be more inclined to talk about it. Uh, it's going to be less of a taboo subject and we can treat it as an injury yeah. more than a disorder. I, I don't know what your thoughts on that matter are. I agree, bro. And, and I believe the latest research is showing that PTS is, is a fragmented memory. Hmm. 
you know, how's that a disorder? Exactly. <laughs> you know, <bro? laughs> like the science, the science is saying when, you know, they investigate the brain and what does that look like? And, you know, it's a memory that has been fragmented and is not put back together efficiently or effectively to be compartmentalized or whatever you do with it, to accept it, to understand it, to not be affected by it. That's not a disorder. You know, it, it's very, it, I hate labels, bro. And, yeah. you know, um, I hate we're so quick to say something and we're so quick to tell somebody you're this. And and the sad thing is most people want to live to that. You know, like we now understand post-traumatic growth because people have a choice to be better and understand what's going on for themselves. And, and it's so many modalities now that can help people. You know, it's about finding what works for you and what you accept and, and what the right person to help you is, if that's what you need. And um, because so many of us have been, you know, so many people that we've seen be hurt have got better. So, you know, yeah, again, bro, it pisses me off too, disorder. Like, <laughs> yeah. who are you to tell, you know, because it's not that. No. You know, that's the truth. It's not that. So telling somebody who's wanting to hear that there's something wrong with me, <laughs> I've got a disorder, I can live to that, then, you know, that's not, that's not help. That's not right. No, it's not. So uh, obviously you said you've been studying this for quite a number of years. Um, now, what, what sort of advice would you be giving to service personnel or, you know, a, a veterans that, that may think they might have sort of PTS? What would be sort of telltale signs of having these um, mental injuries? My my advice would be go and find somebody who can can offer you the real advice to whether you do or you don't, you know, get try and get an effective diagnosis to say whatever you, the symptoms you are facing are uh, are associated with with past trauma, um, and then trying to identify a modality that sits with you um, that can help you move through that process, you know, somebody who uses the right language or the right understanding. Uh, to get you to a point, big thing we're observing in New Zealand, a friend of mine, ex-Royal Marine Commando, um, has now become a mental health practitioner after his own uh, own issues, own struggles with PTS. Yeah, we, we just fully understand that, you know, sometimes veterans need veterans to help them. Hmm. So it's finding that that person who speaks the same language. So you and I nod when we talk to each other that... You know, I'm sure you've met that person who goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what the IED feels like. You don't know what, you know, when your car's bumping off the road into a ditch and, and all the glass is gone. You you don't know. Um, but having good people that understand that, I think, can help make that process. But, yeah, find somebody who who understands if you can do that and and just choose. Choose to be better. Choose to be on a journey and choose to understand that if you have been hurt, then like you said, injury, bro, we, you know, if we've got a sore yeah. ankle, we put ice pack on, Yeah. you know, but you've got to do, you've got to do something proactive to be better. Um, exactly. Yeah. I, th and I think it's very much um, the stigmas that are, that are holding, um, holding us back from talking about these issues, uh, which is obviously, you know, the main reason why I'm, uh, I, I do this podcast is say it is all right for us to talk about it. Um, and, and like you say, having the same language and knowing um, the people around us have been through the same ordeal rather than sitting there and having a doctor and go, oh, I understand how you feel. Like you say, <laughs> they don't. Uh, so having the, the veterans help veterans um, is, is quite a big thing. Um, uh, and obviously, you, you like you were saying, you were doing a lot of um, outdoor activities. Uh, and I believe you, you said that... Um, you found a way to help PTS through these outdoor activities. Yeah, like we've known for a long time, you know, the research is, is well proven that, um, you know, using nature as a modality. And again, I just talk for people that this works, it works, you know, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I don't beat the drum that just do this yeah. because I understand my partner works with horses. She does equine stuff, um, which is amazing. You know, we, there's so many amazing, just find what works for you. But um, for me, yeah, nature is a modality of getting people out and, and you know, it's so multifaceted with one, it's getting you out into nature where you are connected with the earth for us. We call it Papatuanuku, Mother Earth. Um, you're connecting with her. We know nature vibrates at a frequency that is healing, like science shows us that, you know, that it resonates at a megahertz that our body align with, which makes us better. Uh, we know we're getting sunlight in our eyes. 
Uh, most times when you're in the back country or outdoors, you're getting good food. Um, and for us, it's that, bro, you're with community, you're with others, and it's a shared experience. Yeah. You know, when I take my modalities, kayaking, where you see kayaking as a vehicle to, you know, we call it a vehicle to move them through a journey. Um, and when you're doing that with mates and you get a bit of big sea and, you know, it's like, it's like being on a patrol, bro. You get back, you get in, you're at a campfire, you've got good food. You go, oh, you were scared. And <laughs> no, I wasn't. And, you know, you know, you, it's, it's shared, but you're with other people and you're, you're moving through this and, and, you know, you know what it's like, you sit around a campfire, bro, and people start yeah. telling stories, Yeah, you know, and, and people start telling stories and you look over and, and somebody's nodding and I feel the same and yeah, you feel the same and, you know, and. I've found people sleep, mate. People, um, you know, people haven't slept for a long time uh, out of nature. They they sleep and they get up in the morning and said, I had a, I had a full night's sleep last night. Um, and you're like, awesome. You know, yeah. So that sounds um, very similar to, to what I, I have a, a, a group of friends who um, uh, are ex-military reservists um, current serving as well. And we all get together and we, we, have a little camp over and we do these um, military simulations it's quite uh interesting how we bond together uh like you say around the campfire spinning the ditch and you, you see people around the fire nodding and sort of agreeing and it's yeah. um it's very therapeutic to be around yeah. uh like-minded people yeah. that have experienced the same sort of things and yeah like you say it's, it's almost a, a form of uh group therapy in a time to almost decompress things that you might not have spoken about before yeah as i said to you my, my mate this royal marine commando um he he left england and, and run to new zealand to, to hide out you know he was suffering severely with pts uh, and we've only become friends in the last six months and he until we become friends and started talking he hasn't talked about his military career for 10 years yeah you know which is just hiding from it um, and we now get to share stories of very similar experiences and, and, you know, we get to do that in a safe way and, um, it's awesome for both of us. And yeah, it's funny. I took just, yeah, a couple of, about a, a couple of months ago, I took a group of XSAS guys out on a kayaking trip and they're all, all guys I served with. And you know what, the biggest thing for one of them was that I just get to talk however I want to talk, no yeah. political correctness, no boss telling me I can't say this, no, somebody saying this, I just get to talk. And, and that was his therapy, um, you know, and he got so much from that, um, that he just got to be free and use whatever language he wanted to and whatever context, you know, it wasn't derogatory, it wasn't racist, it wasn't sexual, but he just got to talk and verbalize. Yeah. We all understood his language. And, and that was powerful, you know. Um, you um, went back in the military as a, um, as a trainer, I believe. Um, yes. Um, obviously, we spoke earlier in the interview uh, about resilience, and that's something that you were uh, teaching, I believe. Yeah. So, luckily, we're running a program for uh, one of the military units at the moment, um, a resilience program. Again, using the sea kayak as a journey uh, to educate them on a on a different way to see resilience mm. and giving them the tools to to be, yeah, resilient. Um, it's something all our people, our young people, are are missing, and um, it's something the army's struggling with, and yeah, got some meetings lined up with our our military when we go back to or they go back to work uh, around doing it for everybody, um, because we're seeing like everybody else, every other military is suffering with entry rates and attrition. Uh, we had our we call a core training, infantry core training, not so long ago. Um, started with sixty, finished with eighteen. Mm you know, and for an army that we are, we are losing people at a rapid rate at the moment. So if we can't even keep them through their training cycle, you know, we're never going to regenerate our, um, our organization. So, um, yeah, it's, we're just trying to offer them a piece of, of, of that puzzle. Like how can we, uh, offer you the whole organization and your young people and for us, it's self-awareness. If you understand self, you can make so many better decisions. You know, if I understand who I am and how I'm feeling, and then I understand how I communicate that to you as a as a peer, and then how do I communicate that to you as my leader? You know, we just know we can be so much better. Yeah. Obviously, um, resilience can help you in the moment, but obviously it can help you uh, later on when you're dealing with things that you may have experienced. Um, what sort of things are you doing? Because obviously, 
um one of the big questions like i alluded to earlier you know nature versus nurture is is resilience something that you can teach or is it something that you have inside you now obviously you have this course that you're you're teaching resilience and what sort of methods are you using right so yeah again we're using sea kayak as a journey um mm -hmm. to get them out in nature but to also you know it's intertwined with giving them an experience that they may not have had before and 99% and of these soldiers that we've got coming on our program have never been sea kayaking. Um, so just that is a shared experience that they get to do together. Um, but every day is structured and uh, we teach intention setting. So just in them setting and understanding how they want to be for that day uh, as an individual and then as a group. Uh, we do breathing. So uh, most of our courses we try and do through winter. So the water's a bit colder um we we make them do some kayak rescue stuff where we teach breathing first just simple box breathing but uh then linking breathing to decision making so when we take them out on the water and make them do a you know a rescue session at four o'clock in the afternoon in the winter um in the ocean um they've got the cold to deal with and they've got a new skill there's this kayak rescue that we're teaching them so they're having to link breathing and that together and um, then we do a day down a canyon um, which is you have to abseil through waterfalls, you have to get lowered through waterfalls. Uh, again, middle of winter, the water's freezing. Um, you have to jump off a six metre and an eight metre jump. And, you know, a lot of people, young people talk tough, but when you get them up into these, bro, they're cold, um, they're wet. So that day we teach self-talk. So just how do we talk to ourselves and, and motivate ourselves and how do we, you know, the the, the bad voice and the good voice. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we do... We take them up to a, a, an ancient forest, um, a thousand year old forest here in New Zealand or where we are. And, and they do a session with some trees. So connecting with a tree and, and doing some timeline. Uh, and then we finish off with just reframing, like teaching them how to reframe experiences from their lives to, to, to change it and see it a different way and take the learning from that. And all of that as a journey just links into each thing we're offering as a skill to be resilient, um, a, a strand of that. And, you know, when we have those skills all put together, then then that's what we can fall back on when when things get hard. Like I know how to breathe. I know how to set an intention. I know how to uh, to do these things. So the initial scope of the course was to be more proactive than reactive. I think that uh, sounds like a very good course. And I hope maybe we could uh, see about something very similar in the, in the UK, perhaps up in the... Uh mountains of scotland where it can be quite fresh on occasions yeah. um what advice would you give to uh somebody who's probably transitioning from the military life to civilian life uh because obviously that again in itself can be a quite a traumatic experience for a number of other reasons Again, back to my my friend, the ex Royal Marine, um, who's working in the now the mental mental health space as a as a mental health practitioner. Um, he was talking to a guy in Australia uh, just before Christmas, who spent twenty years working with veterans. Um, he's an ex Australian military guy, but he's been in the professional space uh, for for twenty years. And Ben was talking to him and said, "What are the three key things that you'd say and uh, for a veteran?" And um, it was belonging, identity, and purpose with the three key things that we all know, eh? Yeah. Um, so with an understanding of that, in, in any podcast you listen to, people talk about that, eh? Um, so for me, it would be knowing those three things, identify them early. Like you need purpose. That's what we joined and, and got into a uniform for was purpose. Um, identity was belonging to the tribe, whatever tribe or, or colored hat you wear or beret. Eh? Um, and then, you know, and your purpose identity um, and belonging, like I need to belong to something, you know, I need to belong to something bigger than me. And um, so I feel that if we know those things, leaving, and we've already put those in place, uh, then I think we would have a better, a better chance of, of thriving post service, um, than just, you know, falling in the cracks, like a lot of people do. Absolutely. That's some perfect advice. Um, one last question I'll probably um, leave us with for this interview is looking back on your on your time, obviously, um, you, you set out the goal to um, join the Special Forces, which you did. Um, everything seemed to have laid out as you wanted. Now, is there anything that you would go back and do differently or, or do you look back on it and think that's exactly how I wanted things to turn out? Personally, I think... 
it was laid out for me to give me the skills and knowledge to be where I am now. Yeah. Yeah. So I look back and, you know, I also worked at Outward Bound in New Zealand as an instructor and I've had the opportunity to do a whole lot of things, but they've just given me the education to be now talking to you, you know, so that's my reflection. So I wouldn't want it to be any different, you know, it'd be very, I have no regrets in life. Um, I don't regret anything I've done. I've made some poor decisions. <laughs> I've done some dumb shit. Um, you know, I've lost a lot of money doing funny things, um, but I wouldn't take it any back because I'm, I'm now talking to you and, and we're sharing an experience where, you know, hopefully somebody can hear this and go, I need belonging. I need some identity. I need some purpose and, and they can strive to do that. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't do anything different, mate. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll find most yeah. veterans same, say the same thing that they, no matter what they've experienced and what they've been through, they, they wouldn't change it because it's made them who they are at this point in time. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've found uh, through many of the veterans that I spoke to is, is writing. Obviously, you've had an incredible journey up to this point. Would uh, an autobiography um, be something that you would look at in the future? Definitely. And it's, a, it's actually a dream of mine to do that. Um, what is holding me back is, is finding somebody to write it. And uh, I met a guy last year who we actually spent six months house sitting for, who's a South African guy, um, but he's a world explorer. Um, he's done the North Pole. He's done the South Pole three times solo, uh, sailed around the world. Um, just an amazing human. Uh, and as we become friends, he asked me, he said, oh, would you ever write a book? So I thought about it. And he just offered me the advice that know why you're writing it. Yeah. It, are you writing this for you as a story or are you writing this to help people? Um, so that's something I've been contemplating a lot. So I'd love to write a book because I have had these, um, I've had an amazing journey so far and, and it, it continues. Um, I just have to know that writing the book would be the right, right thing to do. Well, by, by the sounds of uh, your experiences, it's, it's probably definitely another book if it was ever yeah. to be written that I would add to my collection, and and uh, yeah. it would be pride of place up on the uh, up on the shelf up here. So, um, yeah. thank yeah. you very much for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating yeah. talking to you. You've um, yeah. it's nice that you share some uh, thoughts and suggestions on PTS as the same as what I do, uh, and obviously here in the UK, I'm going to keep challenge that, keep see if we can drop the stigma and. Uh, stop calling it a disorder and like, like we say, try and call it an injury, um, which is what obviously the, uh, the research suggests. Um, thank you very much for, you know, sharing uh, your thoughts on how nature can help heal. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. Welcome, bro. Hey, could I just throw out there lastly that, you know, we, we say it's a stigma, but it's, you know, if we take nine eleven as a point of, us been at conflict for a long time yeah okay it's 22 years you know let's let's stop calling it a stigma veterans and service people let's stop saying these things and and just know that you and i are talking and you've had so many veterans on and, and i've you know i've talked to a lot in my time we're at a point where this is important to talk you know we've all discovered that so let's let's get out and the last thing i'd say bro is like that belonging piece i talked about um all your people are still out there. Just reach out. Yeah. You know, you're not lost. You're not this, you're not that just reach out to your people and you might find that they want to have a beer too or whatever, whatever you do. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Appreciate you brother. Appreciate you too. Thank you.